Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Castor webinar series. Castor is a T-Course 2.0 site at the University of Michigan and Georgetown University. And this webinar series is being hosted by our Career Enhancement Corps. Uh, today, uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Ross Hammond join us to give a webinar on agent-based modeling and applications in tobacco regulatory science. But we, before we get started with the webinar, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping information. Uh, the webinar will last about one hour. It will be about 30 to 40 minutes of presentation with 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, all participants are muted upon entry and may only be muted by the host. Um, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature. Uh, and after the end of the webinar, there, you will be redirected to a very brief five question survey, which I encourage you all to fill out because it helps us evaluate our webinars and, and uh, think of new topics for future events. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Ross Hammond, and then Dr. Hammond will uh, carry on with his presentation. Um, Dr. Ross Hammond is the Betty Bowfinger Brown Professor in the Brown School of Social Work at, the, at Washington University in, Los, in St. Louis. With over 20 years of experience in complex system science modeling methodologies, Dr. Hammond brings his expertise in these approaches to problems in social science, public policy, and public health. Dr. Hammond's research applies complex systems tools to generate new insights into the social dynamics that drive many difficult public policy problems like tobacco control, as well as identify potential leverages, points, and windows for intervention. He's a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, where he's the director of the Center for Social Dynamics and Policy. He also holds academic appointments at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Santa Fe Institute. Dr. Hammond is a health and human services appointed member of the NIH Minority Health and Health Disparities Institute Advisory Council, and he serves as a public health advisor for the National Cancer Institute. Uh, He's also an advisory special government employee for the FDA Center for Tobacco Products, a commissioner for the Lancet Commission on Obesity, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences Food and Nutrition Board. So it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Hammond and share his insights into tobacco regulatory science and the role of agent-based modeling. Dr. Hammond, if you're ready, you can uh, begin uh, right now. Thank you for that introduction. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to try to give you a very brief background on why agent-based modeling might be well-suited, not just for tobacco regulatory science, but for a number of related problems in population health. And then I'll dive deep into specific tobacco applications through the work that I and many other colleagues uh, have done using agent-based modeling to create something called Tobacco Town which I'll talk about in several uh, iterations. And then at the end, we'll circle back to talk about some broader themes about uh, where this work might be going and how it fits into a broader current of science in this space. And then I'll leave time for questions and answers. So again, uh, quickly disclaimer, as mentioned, I hold a number of uh, sort of policy oriented advisory appointments, but nothing that I say in this presentation should be construed as the opinion of any of these august bodies. They're just my own opinions. As I said, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce this tobacco town model with a bit of background. Um, I'll show you some real world applications of the work as well as going through how we got to the, the product we've, we've achieved now in phases, which is I think a best practice in modeling of this kind. Uh, and I hope there will be a lively discussion. I'm gonna begin by just highlighting why we're using this approach, which I think is that many public health problems, including tobacco control are complex. And by complex, I don't just mean complicated. I mean some pretty specific features that a problem can have uh, that define it in this way. And the first of these is that the behaviors and the outcomes we care about are affected by the interaction of many different factors across multiple scales. I think this is best illustrated actually by looking at this map, which is actually about obesity. 
Uh, and what I want you to take away from this diagram, which I've made purposely too small for you to read the detail of, is that each of these little boxes with words in it is a measurable factor, a variable about which there is data. And they're across many different sectors, as you see here. And the arrows represent evidence-based causal relationships between these variables. So this is a deeply interdependent system. There are maps like this that NCI and others have drawn for tobacco is a similarly complex landscape. The next thing on my list is that these systems often have multiple heterogeneous and adaptive actors. Uh, and I want to stress this idea of adaptation because Institute of Medicine did a whole consensus report on the use of agent-based models to study tobacco control and really highlighted the importance of this adaptation piece. My illustration for adaptation uh, comes from the biology of obesity as you gain and lose weight your actual processing of calories is different, but you could imagine similar pictures, biological pictures for say nicotine addiction uh, and the duration of smoking. Uh, and you could also imagine different kinds of behavioral adaptation, some even maybe strategic on the part of say the tobacco industry. The third thing on my list is the importance of context, which I'm really gonna focus a lot on in today's presentation. Uh, and there's various kinds of context. There's physical environments. On the left, I have a map of fast food density in uh, New York City. On the right, I have maps of tobacco retail density, which is what I'll be focusing on today. Both of these pictures are actually quite rich geographies. And if I were to do something like chop them up into zip codes, take the average in each zip code and try to run regressions on that, to correlate with, with something that we care about, you can imagine that I would lose a lot of the important richness that actually governs how people who live in these spaces and move through them interact with them and are exposed to different kinds of opportunities. There are also social environments uh, which have been studied both for obesity and for tobacco control uh, by Christakis and Fowler and many others. Uh, and then these are dynamic systems with lots of feedback. All of these things turn out to be canonical features of complex systems, which is a whole field unto itself. They are also real challenges, both for science and for policy, for reasons that we'll be diving into in this presentation. Agent-based modeling is seen as a potential solution to some of these challenges to assist us in managing them. Agent-based modeling is a still relatively new computational approach for modeling complex social dynamics. When we build an agent-based model, we build, in a sense, an artificial society on the computer composed of individuals who we call agents. These individuals get rules which govern their interaction with each other and with the environment. Uh, and we create an entire population of them, often in a spatial context. These agents can actually be at multiple levels of scale. So you can have agents who are people as in the models I'll show you today, but you can also have agents who are immune cells in the body or who are multinational corporations or more than one of these things at once, if you like. And once you have your population and your context, you press go and the agents zoom around and do what they've been programmed to do. And then you watch the social patterns that emerge from the bottom up through all these decentralized interactions uh, of agents. Why do people like agent-based modeling? They like it for, I think, three reasons that are important to stress for the purposes of this talk. The first is because we are modeling at the individual level, we do not have to aggregate in any way. We do not have to have representative agents as we do in economics or compartments as we do in epidemiology. Uh, we can have as much diversity among our agents as we need to. And that's an important advantage for things like disparities, which live large in tobacco control. The second reason people like agent-based modeling is because you can embed in an agent-based model as complex uh, as a depiction as you'd like of real space, physical spaces or social spaces. As I showed you before, you don't have to simplify or aggregate the space either. Um, and that matters a lot if we care about something like retail policy, which is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and the third reason that people like agent-based models is that they provide a, way, a, a very uh, rigorous way to think uh, in principled terms about counterfactuals, about how the world will, would look different if we imposed various kinds of policies we might be considering, um, what kind of data we would need to build a better model, lots of things that we, we can't do uh, with, with empirical analysis alone. And those are the reasons to use agent-based modeling. We've taken agent-based modeling as an approach and built something called Tobacco Town, which is for retail-based tobacco control policy. Why Tobacco Town? Well, there's a particular interest at FDA and elsewhere in spatial retailer point of sale policies as a way to um, contain tobacco. And there's been lots of experimentation by state and local policy authorities, but there still is no general evidence base 
about what works or how it works or any general theory about this. So lots is going on on the ground, but it's not really based yet in, in very much evidence. So the key question for Tobacco Town is, how will changes in the distribution of tobacco retailers uh, actually affect patterns of tobacco purchase or use through time? There's also a need for a model like this because there's a, a real sense that what is going to work in San Francisco is not necessarily going to work in Atlanta. And what is going to work in a big city is not necessarily going to work in the, in the rural places of America. And so this kind of tailoring to different contexts may be an important part of what we're trying to learn for Tobacco Town. Just to review, for those of you who haven't come across uh, density-oriented policies before, why would we want to reduce tobacco density? Well, first and foremost, it decreases availability. It in increases the search cost of obtaining tobacco. Uh, it potentially also decreases the visibility of environmental cues to smoke. It changes social norms, and it reduces what are many people are calling uh, tobacco swamps, uh, which are places that just have so much density of tobacco that, that, that they're saturated. Uh, and I think many policymakers who first enter this space think of initially, a priori, the relationship between the density of tobacco in a landscape and the cost uh, uh, incurred by tobacco users to obtain tobacco looking something like this, where when there's high density, the costs are low, and then there's a linear um, increase in costs associated with decreasing den density. But if we do a quick thought experiment, you'll see why this might not be the case. So let's imagine this little girl here who walks on her way to elementary school down Main Street in this particular town, uh, and we have here our six tobacco retailers. Let's imagine that we impose a very um, draconian, what would be seen as a very heavy-handed policy that immediately forces two-thirds of the tobacco retailers to close. But in fact, to this little girl, that makes very little difference in her experience of the world because there's two more just on the next block. So we haven't changed her exposure or costs very much at all. Uh, and this implies that the impact in general might depend a lot on the specific spatial structure and that the relationship between density and cost might look more like this. And then, of course, there's adaptation through time. So if you close a bunch of tobacco retailers, the others may not sit still. They may actually change what they're doing in an adaptive way, uh, which would change the impact of the policy. So Tobacco Town was created to allow us to, uh, be a, to, have, to build a policy laboratory that can look at all kinds of different retail-oriented policies, zoning policies, licensing policies, and understand how their impact will vary across lots of different geographies and lots of different demographies to think through uh, what the, these policies will really do and which policies are best suited for different communities. This is an example of the kind of policy that we set out to look at originally. Um, these blue buildings in this artist rendering are schools. Uh, and you can see a real, real world policy that has uh, been discussed widely is to draw buffer zones around schools of say a thousand yards and remove all tobacco sales or advertising in those buffer zones. So that shows before and after here. This has been funded by a series of different NIH grants and I have many collaborators, Doug Liu, Kurt Rubicil and uh, Lisa Hendrickson and many others that uh, uh, contributed to the work I'm showing you. And there's been a series of papers, uh, some of which I'm showing here, showing different versions of the evolution of this model and different applications. And these are the things I'm going to draw on for my presentation today. And a core best practice in agent-based modeling, the power of agent-based modeling is that the sky's the limit. You can include as much complexity in principle as you'd like. Uh, you can have uh, very few constraints on what you can assume about the world or what you can depict. But that's also its Achilles heel because models that are too complex too quickly are very difficult to use well and to interpret. So a core best practice is actually to build up what will eventually be complex models slowly in layers iteratively. And that's in fact what we did with Tobacco Town. So there's really three phases, I would say, of work uh, on Tobacco Town that have been going on over the last number of years. Um, the first phase of Tobacco Town really focused on the core choice behaviors that drive Tobacco Town, and I'll explain what those are in a second. Then the second phase started to layer in some more complexity about retailers and about behavior, um, and to start to try to apply this in the real world. And then phase three uh, added in, uh, which we're still in, in right now, is adding quite a lot of geospatial and demographic complexity and to scale the application to policy settings actually in the 20 largest cities in the US, which I'll talk about. So I'm going to try to go through all of these in the time I have available. Um, the first is this more abstract model 
uh, that has very little uh, space, real structural space, uh, and uh, sort of very simplified demographics that does not look at downstream behaviors like cessation, and that does not have any product differentiation. So everyone in first version of Tobacco Town either uh, is smoking cigarettes or they're not, and we don't look at any other tobacco products. And the way Tobacco Town basically works is that our agents are a population of adult smokers. Some of them are light smokers, some of them are heavy smokers, so they have different amounts of consumption rates per day of cigarettes. They live in one of four stylized, idealized kinds of places, a wealthy urban place, a poor urban place, a wealthy suburban place, or a poor suburban place. And I'll be more specific about what those mean in a second. Um, and every day, they go from some home destination to some work destination and back again. And they do that either on foot, by bike, or by car. In later versions, there's other alternatives as well. Uh, and what they do is along their route uh, every day to and, from, uh, to and from work, they stop potentially to purchase, to make a purchase decision about tobacco, about cigarettes. Um, and then they have this daily consumption rate. Uh, and if they run low on the inventory of cigarettes, they need to maintain their smoking rate, then they buy more. And the big decision of Tobacco Town for the agents in this version is, um, where do I buy tobacco and how much do I buy? Uh, and the way that agents decide that is one using one of three very different kinds of individual choice functions, a fully rational rule, a two-phase rule, or a learning rule. And I'll talk more about those in detail. Um, and then we have some uh, idealized representation of a space that has densities of different kinds of tobacco retailers, convenience stores, pharmacies, liquor stores, there's a long list of these. Um, we know where the workplaces are, we know where the schools are, we know what the population looks like. And then what we care about as an outcome from this is the total cost experienced by tobacco consumers uh, to obtain the tobacco that they need. Uh, and this is a function both of purchase cost, the pack price, but also of, uh, if you like, the opportunity costs, the travel time and costs associated with actually getting off their route to buy tobacco. Uh, these are the kinds of idealized towns we used. Um, these are some different characteristics of the towns, both in terms of tobacco, the number of retailers, the population, the kinds of transportation individuals are using. These are actually drawn from real data, but they're for some um, sort of uh, archetypal cities in California that we used as uh, to represent our abstract um, kinds of towns. And then we go through this whole process, which I'm not going to, don't worry if you're worried by these equations, I'm not going to walk you through them in detail. But essentially what we do in this model is we ask each, um, each agent to, for each retailer that exists, um, to think about uh, how many, how many uh, packs of cigarettes they need to buy um, and uh, what the price charge that that retailer is. Um, how far they would have to travel off their route to get to that retailer, or what, how costly that is based on whether they're on foot or on a bike or in a car, um, based on their also their income, their opportunity cost of time. Uh, and then to optimize, to actually pick the retailer and the amount of cigarettes to buy at once that, that maximizes their utility. That's what all these uh, equations are doing. And the way this looks is here, we're looking at, a, say, a dense urban core at rush hour, and we're in a helicopter looking from the top down at rush hour. And all of these orange dots that are zipping around on the intersections of the street grid are agents. And these big squares are tobacco retailers, and they flash yellow when someone buys tobacco at them, as does the agent who made the purchase. And they're different um, sizes and shapes to represent different kinds of tobacco retailers with different prices and inventory. Uh, and then the agents all get to their destinations in the morning, and they're going to repeat this in the evening. And then what we do is we run this model with a starting set of retailers, and then we systematically alter the location and type and costs of retailers to represent different policy interventions that one might consider and compare those to the baseline to understand how that actually affects the tobacco consumers. That's basically how Tobacco Town works. From this first version of Tobacco Town, we learned a number of interesting things. The three that I want to highlight here is that there is, in fact, as I suggested in my thought experiment, a nonlinear relationship in the model anyway, between between the costs experienced by tobacco retailer uh, by tobacco consumers and the density of retailers, um, which is uh, good news if you're on the steep part of the curve on the left, shown in this upper left-hand corner graph, um, the maroon dots. 
Uh, but bad news, if you're all the way over to the right, if you're starting with a very high density of retailers, it's going to take a lot of movement to make much difference to the cost experienced by individual consumers. The second thing that's uh, important to policymakers from this work is that policy effects really differ across contexts. So what you're looking at down the right-hand side of this slide uh, for different kinds of policies, a retailer licensing cap, a school buffer, as I showed in my illustration at the beginning, for each of these, we're showing for the four town types um, what a, a, a medium-sized or a more extreme policy would look like in terms of the density that it actually creates of tobacco retailers. And what you can see is that the effects really differ and what the right choice, uh, if you're in an urban wealthy environment, it would be from a policy perspective is very different than if you're in a suburban poor environment, for example. The more hopeful result, uh, which is the third one on this slide, is that stacking multiple policies actually has a super additive effect. So doing small doses of more than one thing can actually be more powerful than doing a very extreme form of a single uh, policy to reduce retail. We also, in this work, uncovered a lot of individual level detail about dynamics. And an interesting thing, uh, another reason to iterate models like this is that you often, by, by the act of modeling, discover what the most important data gaps in a field are. And so here are all these nice, rich individual dynamics. On the upper left, we're looking at for two different kinds of decision rules that agents might be following, the average total travel plus purchase costs um, that are experienced. Uh, then we're looking in the middle here uh, at over time at how the costs experienced by individuals change uh, in terms of uh, uh, cost per pack. Uh, based on what decision rule is going on. And then in the bottom, we're looking at average pur purchase characteristics in terms of how people, how far people actually travel out, out of their way um, based on their income. All three of these things, there is no data, there was no data on any of this. So we could not compare these individual level dynamics to real world analogs from data because this is not data that had been collected at the time that this work was doing, but it actually is very important data. Um, not only to get a model like this calibrated properly, but also actually for, for lots of policy purposes. So this model helped drive the fielding of new data collection, which I will talk about later in the presentation to start to get at some of these things. So now I'm going to move to the second phase of Tobacco Town. And in this phase, we add in cessation and initiation on either side of tobacco purchase. And these turn out to be really important, obviously, to policymakers. So when we tried to actually apply this with real in the real world with policymakers, they wanted to know not just how much tobacco cost for people who are currently smoking, but how many fewer people would smoke if these policies were in place. So we had to include these kinds of things. Um, we also, because of the places we were applying this and what their policy priorities were, um, added in more product differentiation, in particular menthol, because a lot of the places we worked with were considering menthol bans, and more demography to look at disparities, as well as uh, demographic-specific cross-elasticities, meaning if I'm a um, LGBT African-American male, um, what is my rate of substitution between menthol and regular uh, cigarettes, for example, those kinds of things, which are, are empirically driven, get added into the model. The two places we worked with first to apply Tobacco Town are New York City and the state of Minnesota um, through a variety of different grants and contracts that I can talk about. For Minnesota in particular, we then took these idea of prototype towns the four urban rich, urban poor, suburban rich, suburban poor. We added two more, rural, rich, and poor. And then we, instead of having them drawn from California data, we drew them from representative cities in the state of Minnesota, which are shown here. Uh, this first, I've made these pretty small because I don't want you to worry too much about the details, but the left table shows all kinds of um, transportation and place statistics, school densities, workplace densities, proportion of people driving cars versus walking, how fast the cars go at rush hour, and so on. On the right are a whole bunch of statistics about retailers. What is the density per square mile of convenience stores that sell cigarettes, liquor stores, pharmacies, tobacconists? What is the average regular 
pack price for each of these um, for menthol and for regular. And then finally, what is the distribution of the population across a variety of different income and demographic categories? Um, so all that goes into to this version of Tobacco Town. In addition, um, to, to be able to look at menthol and its cessation, those are things we're adding to the model. We have a new uh, part of the model uh, that goes along with the details that I provided earlier, and this is called a, a purchase loop in which individuals who are going to buy tobacco decide whether they're going to buy tobacco, or menthol tobacco, regular tobacco, or in fact, not going to purchase anything because the prices or the, the inconvenience are too high. Uh, for them, and they follow a whole function to try to decide which of these three things they're going to do based on the conditions they face at the moment. The agents who do not who, who do not purchase cigarettes then uh, have a, for a number of days in a row then enter uh, a loop whereby they may actually quit smoking altogether. And we tried to calibrate that to data about quit attempts and, and successful cessation um, in ways that I can talk more about. And then we applied this model to look at different policies than we did in the first version of Tobacco Town in some cases to reflect the stakeholder policy priorities. Um, in this case, restricting menthol cigarettes sales to tobacco specialty shops or uh, in, including that with a retail to retail buffer. And for each of these, for each of the four, uh, the six town types and for various subpopulations demographically, we estimated um, the difference in cost uh, that was experienced. We also built some additional ways to look at what is going on in Tobacco Town. So this is another approach we use to uh, visualize agent-based models. Um, so here we're going to follow an individual smoker uh, in Tobacco Town in this sort of um, cartoonish uh, world, a representation of the world. So here this tobacco uh, user um, goes back and forth between home and work, and work. They have various properties that are shown here. Um, they have behaviors like um, going to the store, buying cigarettes, considering where to buy cigarettes. Um, they have an inventory of packs of tobacco that they are holding. Um, they have an amount that they're smoking uh, every day. Then they make various purchases, which are shown here, how much they paid, how many, how many packs they bought, what kind of cigarettes they bought, where they bought them. Um, and we can follow uh, this individual as they go through uh, their, their, the simulated period, which I think is about a year in this case, um, and see what choices they make and how those depend on features uh, of the environment as well as their own state. The third phase, and I'm moving pretty rapidly through this um, in the interest of getting through it all in time, but I'm happy to go into details in the Q&A if you like. In this third phase, which we're just in now still uh, with Tobacco Town, we add in quite a lot more uh, spatial and demographic complexity, and we're scaling application of this to the 20 largest cities in the U.S. And we're doing that um, using two different things, synthetic populations and GIS maps. All of this is part of a much broader um, a center that NCI has funded uh, that's called Aspire that Tobacco Town you'll see is one of the three pillars of, but it also includes lots of data collection. And in fact, it's data collection that is inspired in part by the earlier work with Tobacco Town so that we are now measuring things about how far smokers will travel out of their way to buy tobacco and uh, how much they buy at once and what decision rules make sense um, and building, incorporating that into Tobacco Town uh, as we go. That we are also using now, moving away from these idealized town types and these idealized populations, we are actually using um, what are called synthetic populations, um, which I'm showing an example of here. Um, and each of the tiny little uh, sort of uh, purple pixels here is an individual um, who is geolocated in a real space. This happens to be downtown St. Louis that I'm showing you here. Um, and the color coding in this particular slice uh, is by age, but we have lots of different characteristics. For each of these individuals, uh, we have uh, not real, but synth synthetic data on where they live in XY space, um, where they work, um, their route that they take between home and work, uh, all kinds of aspects of their demography, um, and uh, all sorts of geographic uh, detail. And this comes from a large investment that NIH made actually for the four models of infectious disease that are agent-based um, in creating these synthetic populations that draw on census data, but also a variety of other data sets that are uh, put, put together to create uh, for the entire United States synthetic populations at the resolved at the individual level that are geospatially and demographically accurate, um, but that are abstracted away from real data enough to avoid privacy uh, concerns. And these are very useful for agent-based modeling. They take a lot of computation and processing to use well, but we have in fact built these now into Tobacco Town. And then we 
marry those with very detailed GIS retail maps of where tobacco retailers actually are in each of the 20 largest cities, um, what their actual uh, distribution of, of uh, stock of different kinds of products and prices are. Um, and we superimpose uh, the synthetic populations onto these spaces. So we're bringing a, a tons of, of realism into the model by doing that. Um, and then what we're doing is uh, using Tobacco Town in this much expanded form uh, to actually uh, explore a huge suite of different policies that different cities are considering to help guide them in their choice of policies that are going to have maximum impact for their population and their geography. So that's what we're doing right now. I don't have a paper to show you on this yet, but uh, we hope to this next year. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about that. I want to situate the Tobacco Town work um, and some of the undercurrents of what I've talked about in three broader themes that I think are really important, not just for tobacco control, but for public health generally in using agent-based models um, in this way. Uh, and the first of these is that agent-based models uh, are a really powerful way to try to operationalize place impacts on health, whatever you think those place impacts are, whether they're uh, fast food density or tobacco density or air pollution. Um, and there was a really nice uh, article some years ago in AJE written by um, uh, two professors at the time at um, University of Michigan um, that, uh, that lays out the argument for agent-based modeling as a way to understand place effects on health and is a call to arms, if you like. And our Tobacco Town uh, papers, particularly this one that I have up on the screen now, really try to pick up that gauntlet and show how one can actually um, use modeling as a, as a substrate to uh, dive deep into what place is actually doing. Uh, to health in a way that's much more nuanced than uh, uh, sort of regression analysis can, can quite get at. The second thing I want to highlight is the use of agent-based models as policy laboratories. Um, and this was actually highlighted um, in this uh, consensus report from IOM called Assessing the Use of Agent-Based Models for Tobacco Regulation um, in a piece that appears in the appendix that I wrote that's about uh, agent-based modeling for policy. Um, I think it's important to, to take a step back and think about why you would use models at all uh, for policy purposes, because that's not without controversy, although I think uh, many people in the U.S. are more familiar with the use of models to inform policy uh, since the pandemic has happened than they were perhaps before. Beforehand. But in general, um, one wants to think about models to, uh, for policy purposes when appropriate real world experiments are hard, um, when you can't just run a randomized control trial on the things you care about, when there's lots of heterogeneity across uh, contexts or people or time, um, when you have to think about an adaptive or systemic response uh, that may affect uh, the consequences of a policy, particularly over the long term. That's certainly the case, as highlighted in this report in tobacco, where you can't assume that tobacco producers or retailers will stand still and that, therefore, the short-run um, impact of a policy may diverge from the long-run impact. Um, and when you have to manage uncertainty, models can be a really useful guide to policy. Uh, Agent-based modeling, in particular, is a, is a way uh, to develop principled um, experiments in the computer to understand what the potential consequences of policies in the real world might be ahead of time, um, to what some of the trade-offs might be amongst those policies, um, and what kind of uh, coordination you would need across settings and time uh, to do that effectively. And what we do with uh, many of our results is actually build these things that are interactive that we call dashboards. And this is a static picture, so I'm not going to show you the interactive nature of it. But you can imagine here down the left that you could click with your mouse to turn on or off different policies that might be under consideration and different subsets of communities in which one might want to do those policies. And then on the right, these uh, graphs will redraw to reflect what Tobacco Town projects would be the impact of that set of policies in those uh, settings. And that kind of um, dashboard allows policymakers to, to sort of get an intuition for how all the different policy things are projected to play out. And finally, um, the Tobacco Town work is a good exemplar of a principle that I'm organizing a lot of my research around right now that I call precision prevention. And this is really the idea that um, when people think about precision medicine, they often think about uh, treatment and they think about biology. So we think of um, uh, customizing cancer treatments to your genetics. Uh, but in fact, there's no reason why precision medicine can also be about prevention. Um, and we can't aspire to be as precise in our prevention of disease 
So we are trying. and social context and things like that. And so uh, what I and many others are trying to do is to figure out uh, how one actually can operationalize this vision of tailoring prevention efforts to something. Uh, and then I think what we tailor to is increasingly not individuals, but contexts. And how we do that is increasingly with this kind of modeling, which enables us to take a core mechanistic model and then see how it plays out differently in different geographies and then how the mix of policies that will work best in different geographies varies along with it. So I'm close to the, the time limit. So I wanna leave you um, with a, a quote from a, yet another uh, IOM report. This one is about the food system, but that argues pretty forcefully um, that we need training for scientists, not only in academia, but in the private sector and government agencies in, uh, in complex systems modeling in particular of the kind that, that I'm showing you here. So this is an uh, area that's growing very rapidly, that's getting lots of uptake and which much more training is needed. And you're all very fortunate to be part of such an excellent enterprise here at the University of Michigan uh, that provides you this kind of uh, training, including continuing education, uh, which I understand is the context in which I'm giving this presentation today. My emails are on this slide. Um, I'm happy to uh, follow up if you don't get a chance to get your, your question in um, during the next uh, 20 minutes that we have left for that. I'm happy to, to field emails from anyone who's interested uh, in, in learning more about this work who's attending today. And with that, I think I will stop uh, sharing if I can get that to happen here. And we can jump into facilitated Q&A. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hammond. Um, and thank you for the audience. Uh, if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A. Uh, and we'll start with the first one here from Ji Yuan Juan. Uh, she's asking, agent-based models seem to use, are very good at handling complex modeling and are flexible to include many factors. Mm -hmm. uh, how do the models get validated when you're dealing with so many different factors at once? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's something we think a lot about. Um, I should say that I actually, I actually dislike the word validation because I don't think any model is valid in the sense that that every model to be at all useful has to abstract away from something about the real world. And so in that sense, they're all wrong. They're all missing some aspect of the real world that probably matters. Um, but I think what we can talk about instead is, is building confidence in our model as a representation of the world. And I think that's a process. Uh, and I think fundamentally the way I think about it is that there's um, two pure forms uh, of, of doing this, one of which is to base the things that go into your model, the ingredients, on the best available theory and data uh, that you can find so that they are that you're not including things in your model that are ad hoc or that are that are floating free of any kind of um, substrate that they're based on. And the other is to have a whole series of outcomes from your model outputs that you can compare rigorously to real world evidence about that same outcome uh, analog in the real world. And we do that both at the at the macro level, uh, but also in, increasingly at the individual level uh, with those kinds of things that I showed you, uh, where we, for example, will field a survey about uh, among active smokers uh, about how far they uh, are willing to travel out of their way or do travel out of their way to purchase tobacco and then compare that to the evidence that coming out of tobacco town to try to, to marry the two to test our model. And we do that systematically for all the different pieces. Um, in the in the in the in the end, what you'd really like to do is to have a model that makes predictions about how a policy will play out, and then to actually field a evaluation study or an RCT where you test those predictions. And that's something we can aspire to, you know, in the longer time horizon. Um, once more of these policies start to hit the ground, and we've done that in other other work, like on infectious disease, for example. Good question. Hi, hi, hi Russ. Thank you for. Hi. Great uh, seminar and and yeah, now excited to to uh, uh, I guess hear more about uh, everything that is happening with Tobacco Town and and just uh, I guess your your work in general. I, I'm maybe following on that and and uh, because I I, I guess uh, I was uh, um, had the that other or the second perspective you you, you mentioned 
about the question of validation, right? And is that mm -hmm. like, okay, so the model make predictions, then uh, how do we actually test that those predictions were valid uh, or maybe use those predictions to inform, um, uh, I guess, additional work or, or, or prevention mm -hmm. strategies or what have you. And, and so from, from what I hear, I gather that in terms of tobacco town that you haven't got to that point but that there might be other other areas where your work has has worked that way. Would you would you mind sharing some examples of that? Or yeah, just uh, some examples about, of yeah. of <laughs> where it's happened in other fields or yeah, in other fields or, or or sort of where you see that it might happen. Let's say within Tobacco Town and and where yeah those. So, so sure. So in in Tobacco Town, what we've been able to do so far is to um, to test outputs of Tobacco Town short of. The, the policy interventions themselves, but other outputs that Tobacco Town produces um, that have real world analogs that can be measured. And as I said uh, at the beginning of when we started to do this work, these things were by and large not measured, but we've been able to arrange for many of them to be measured so that we can test all the outputs that uh, Tobacco Town is producing and, and show that they match up to, to, to the real world uh, wherever possible. And then I think in general, what we would like to do is to uh, actually be in a situation where Tobacco Town um, works with a, a specific city that's going to implement a new policy. We we simulate what that policy might produce. They actually implement that policy, and then several years later, we collect data and compare that to what was projected uh, to happen in Tobacco Town. Because of the, the paucity of actual implementation of policies of this kind uh, across the country, we haven't been able to to do that yet, but that is definitely where we're headed um, with Tobacco Town, um, as specifically as part of Aspire. Um, and then in other fields, uh, we've been able to do this kind of thing where we make uh, empirical projections, like, for example, how a, a, a particular policy will play out in the context of flu pandemic uh, containment, um, and then test that in, uh, against what actually happens in the real world and find that they that they match up. That's something that's uh, reasonably common in the infectious disease world, for example, but that we've also done in, in some other fields. Great. Uh, there's another question um, mm -hmm. from Beatrice Palazzolo. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for your presentation. I was just wondering whether the type of tobacco retailer as well as proximity to certain places, density, time of day, when agents make purchases may also affect agent choices. Yes, that's a really good question. So in all versions of Tobacco Town, it affects agent choices in the sense that policies which target particular kinds of retailers like pharmacies, for example, um, it, it will then change the, the option set for consumers. So if you have a policy that says tobacco can no longer be sold at CVS, then all the agents who were previously buying tobacco at CVS will no longer be able to buy there. They'll have to make a different choice. They'll be affected. Um, at a deeper level, um, the kind of retailer actually is itself an input to the agent's decision making in the more recent versions of Tobacco Town, where we think about, for example, convenience purchases, where I'm already going to the grocery store. Um, and so I'm going to buy tobacco there, even if it costs a bit more, because I don't have to travel out of my way. I'm already there doing something else, buying groceries. And so we want to we capture, when we did surveys of smokers, we found that that was actually a you know, reasonable, reasonably important fraction of purchases happen that way. And so we wanted to capture that in Tobacco Town. So in that sense, um, thinking about the kind of, of retailer will actually shape my, my choice set, um, even in the absence of a policy in, in the current version of Tobacco Town. Oh, great. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering uh, how does how do these models deal with other aspects of the neighborhood? For example, mm -hmm. there may be other types of retail environments, such as bars, fast food mm -hmm. re uh, environments, and those types of environments that may mm -hmm. influence tobacco purchase and tobacco behavior. There may be social yes. environments, like normative mm -hmm. environments, that yep. may influence behavior in terms of where you buy, how much you use. Do these models account for those types of environmental influences in addition to just the retail location and price and those types of factors? Um, not at present, they do not. Uh, although one could imagine expanding the model to do that because the same GIS data that tells us where the tobacco retailers are tells us where all those other kinds of uh, retail locations are. I think, um, the fundamental model uh, of decision making that's at the core of Tobacco Town involves um, purposive planned purchase of tobacco by our smokers. 
um, not sort of uh, um, spontaneous uh, uh, peer influenced uh, potentially um, you know intoxicated purchases of, of tobacco, which I think is what you were hinting with with bars. Mm -hmm. That's sort of not not something that we are currently capturing in Tobacco Town. Uh, what fraction of actual cigarette purchases happen that way? That's an empirical question. Uh, we've tried to collect some data on that that builds confidence for us that this more purposive planned purchasing is, is what we should be focusing on. But I think that's you know an open question. Different studies could find different things. Mm -hmm. I, I think when we started digging into this, there started to be lots of questions about what matters to individuals, and no one had really studied this. Um, so there just wasn't any answer to a lot of these questions. There's starting to be more, more data on that now that we can use. Interesting. Uh, there's another question. Uh, Esther Salazar asks, could you please comment about the feasibility of incorporating uncertainty for agent-based mm -hmm. model predictions? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer that um, in two different ways. The first is at, at, a, at a high level, um, Agent-based models, in my opinion, are really good for thinking about uncertainty um, because they allow you to systematically explore very large parameter spaces um, over which you can vary your assumptions uh, about the world uh, or about the dynamics. And then you can actually speak pretty specifically to the robustness of your conclusions, whether they're policy or otherwise, to that variation. So, for example, um, my um, COVID-19 pandemic policy models are all about helping policymakers manage uncertainty about what variant is coming next or you know, uh, how quickly vaccine effectiveness will fall off or whatever. And we systematically explore variation and all those things to understand which policies are robust to, to all of that and are therefore sort of safe bets no matter what the answer to those things turns out to be. Uh, and you can do that, that with it in, in any field with an agent-based model. Um, the other thing that, I, and I think it's, it's important to do that. I think you should be suspicious of agent-based modelers who don't uh, do enough sensitivity analysis and robustness checking on, on their models. Um, and that's a reason to build them up slowly in pieces, as I, as I said earlier, rather than just start with something with you know hundreds of parameters. Uh, the other way I could answer your question is inside Tobacco Town itself, I glossed over this in the interest of time, but there actually are multiple different decision rules that agents could be following. And we started with what, what sort of an economist would think is going on, which is that all the smokers have perfect information about all the tobacco retailers, um, and they optimize you know, based on all these costs and, and so on and so forth. Um, and maybe that happens some of the time, but that's probably not the most realistic. So we, the next step away from that is that we actually build a, what economists would call a trembling hand into this so that uh, there's some variation in which agents sometimes don't pick the most optimal thing. They pick the second best or the third best. Um, and uh, then we can move further away from that by having um, this rule that we call the two-phase rule that's actually based on some of Elizabeth Brooks' work there at University of Michigan. Um, and in this rule, people use heuristic filters to limit the choice set they will even consider. They'll say things like, I just won't travel more than a mile out of my way. Um, I won't even consider those, those retailers. Or I'm not going to pay more than $5 a pack. I don't care. I, you know, I, I'll walk to the end of the earth to pay less or whatever it is. And then inside this much reduced choice set, they optimize. And then the third rule, which has the most uncertainty of all, is that people are, are um, start completely with no knowledge and they learn. And they sample retailers sort of by happenstance, and they learn about them, and they have favorites that they go back to, but they periodically randomly go somewhere else, and they 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 only know about the tobacco retailers they've been to or their friends have been to, and they don't know about all of the other ones that are far away. And we explore all. It's not clear um, which of these is the right model of how smokers actually make purchase decisions. So at the moment, we experiment with m many ones of these to see what difference it makes. But eventually, we hope to build a study that will actually tell us which of these is the is the most accurate depiction of what's going on. Other I, questions? I, yeah, I, I have a, a, a question, and uh, the I guess the the spatial uh, or the I guess the more complex uh, models that you show at the mm -hmm. end they, they look fascinating. Um, it got me thinking, and 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 I, I was I was wondering like why do you think or what is the motivation to do to include that right? Like what is it that mm -hmm. you're gaining by by adding? Uh, I guess so much richness in terms of the of the of the spatial interactions versus versus where you started, which which seems to be quite insightful and 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 good. So yeah, could, could you yeah could you comment on that? Sure. Yeah. So um, two things that I think are important that we hope we're gaining anyway. One of them is 
um, that uh, the to, to understand why a policy, the same policy is going to work differently in Atlanta than in Minneapolis. A lot of that actually has to do with the geography, the specific uh, where the streets go, how dense, not only how dense the retailer is, but how the density of the retailers is overlaid with the density of the people, with the density of the workplaces and the schools and with the street grid um, that people have to travel on. And those look very, very different in different cities in the U.S. And so therefore, the that's a, a major driver of why the same policy will have different consequences. And we can't really um, get that right by sort of averaging it away. We have to we have to have the ge geographic detail in there um, to understand uh, the consequences of that um, and to therefore be able to yield more accurate testable predictions for Atlanta about how this policy versus that policy is going to play out in their city. Um, and, you know, a subset of that, a corollary of that, I would say, is that it's much more compelling to a policymaker to see a, a recognizable map of their city. Um, and understand how things are going to play out than to sort of see this sort of dot zipping around a you know grid video game thing. Um, the second reason that I think is is really important um, in uh, in thinking through this is that the when we think about inequity and disparities, again, it's it's sort of hard to uh, eliminate the, the geography um, if you want to get that right because where people live in these cities is is not random. Um, and in fact, where menthol sales happen is not random either, and is correlated with where the you know certain demographics live. And so, if you want to understand the the disparity impact of a policy, um, in particular, if you want to avoid policies that make the average better but at the expense of making disparities worse, which some of these policies could do, you really have to have that geographic realism in there um, to get that right. Um, yeah, other questions from the audience? Uh, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, we'd appreciate that. In the meantime, I do have a question. I'm curious about sure. the initiation work that you're taking mm -hmm. on in the current phase. Mm -hmm. Now, yep. the initiation process to me appears to be not fully deterministic and rational. <laughs> Uh, yeah. It may be driven by peer influences, what's happening in your home, genetic mm -hmm. risk, those types of susceptibilities and others. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious, how do you account for that level of complexity in these models that really deal with these, you know, density of retailers and access type issues? Yeah, okay. that's a really good question. So what, actually, when we first started out to build the very first version of Tobacco Town, all these years ago, we actually thought that our agents were going to include minors and non-smokers as well as adult smokers. Um, and we had this whole thing about social influence and social sourcing and all this other stuff. And then we actually dropped that from the model in the interest of focusing on this retail piece. Because as you're hinting a model, uh, even if in principle it can contain arbitrary levels of complexity, there are practical limits um, in terms of the interpretability of the model. Um, and so uh, up until pretty much now, Tobacco Town has only been about current smokers, not non-smokers, and it's only been about adults. Um, and the way that initiation has been working um, is much less developed than how cessation. We have a more sophisticated version of cessation now, but initiation essentially says that when a smoker exits, they're replaced by a new smoker, a new adult smoker. We don't worry about where they came from or why. And the probability that they're of this demographic type and this level of smoking is, is X, is some probability distribution that uh, is data-based. So we don't actually model the process of initiation at all in Tobacco Town. We do include new smokers coming into the model, but we don't actually model sort of where they come from. I think that would be really interesting to do. Um, and when we worked with New York City, they were pushing us to think about um, illicit sales uh, as something that would be interesting to include in this context. So we haven't quite got there. Um, so I think that's a that's a future frontier still. Also getting it from a peer or an adult instead of a store. Indeed, <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, this is another yep. process. Um, yeah. yeah, let's see, other, other questions from the audience? I have one. It's maybe maybe simple, but I, I miss it. But I, I was wondering in the in the I think it's been the setup, but maybe it was also more broad uh, in the mental work. 
Did you look at, at uh, banning menthol, which is, of course, mm -hmm. what FDA is now proposing? And, and yes. do you find that versus the maybe restricting it to certain type of venues or other other restrictions? Yeah, we looked at both of both of those things. And um, when we did the Minnesota specific work, they, that was the primary thing they were interested in. So we spent a lot of time uh, on that. And um, the part that we um, worked hardest on, I think, uh, and to get that right is uh, if, as soon as you have multiple products and you're thinking about removing some from the choice set or making them more expensive, then you have to think about this, uh, the elasticities, the substitution rate, um, which is different for different kinds of agents potentially, um, and what the former menthol smokers will then do, because that uh, determines fundamentally what the outcome is. Um, and so we spent a lot of time um, trying to get that right and calibrating that against data and studies that have looked at that. Uh, so we reasonably competent in that part of Tobacco Town. And I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what the Minnesota results were about what the impact of those th those kinds of bans was, but I, I mean, it's in the paper, so I can I could send it to you or I can go back and look. Mm, th thank you. Yeah. And, and well, I, I was, I guess it's a follow up. I'm curious. So, so was that yeah. done? I think that work was done before e cigs were available. Is that is that correct? Yes, and, and have you correct. sort of updated based on yeah? And I guess maybe elasticity is changing because now there's another uh, potential substitute. And yeah, um, e cigs are not in Tobacco Town right now. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, adding them. Uh, it's not immediately clear that um, the purchase of e cigarettes. Uh, is retailer driven in the way that the purchase of other kinds of tobacco is. Yeah. Um, so we haven't, you know, and there's no internet sales in our model at all mm -hmm. uh, right now. So that's a, that's a, that would be a new frontier that to expand into that we thought about, but haven't executed yet. Yeah. That's going to be my next question is about the whole yeah. internet sale frontier, especially with COVID, how restrictions yep. on social distancing moved us in that area. You know, we're actually, at time, uh, so I okay. appreciate your time with us, Ross, and mm -hmm. your your you know your insights and sharing the, your work on Tobacco Town. Uh, it was an excellent presentation and excellent discussion. Uh, I just want to now remind the audience that once we end the webinar, you will get a five question survey. So please do fill it out. It really helps us gauge our, our work. Um, so with that, I'm going to end the webinar. Uh, thank you, Ross, and thank you for thank the you. audience for being here, and we'll see you all around. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Ross. Thank okay. you. Thanks for including me.